Hey guys, my name is JD and I want to welcome all of you back to our weekly Digging Deeper video series. It's great to be back with you again this week and I'm grateful that you're taking the time to engage with us as we tackle important subjects with regard to God's Word. Today we're continuing a recent pattern of using this time to discuss some memes that we've seen on social media. Specifically, these are memes that deal with issues regarding faith in Christ the Bible, and the church. Um, Now, as we've said every week, the, the point here is not to learn how to start an argument on social media. The purpose here is to help us learn truth so that we are prepared to evaluate what we see online. In other words, when we, when we are prepared to understand God's word and when we have, have heard and listened to and thought through the implications of some of the things that we see online, when we see it, we're not thrown off by it. Uh, we're, able to, we're able to recognize the thought process that's going on behind some of the things that we see on social media. And today we're going to deal with a meme that centers around one of the most controversial and socially challenging concepts in all of Christianity, hell. Now, hell is one of those aspects of Christianity that is troublesome for many people. It's not uncommon to run across skeptics or even some people proclaiming that they're Christians who deny either the reality of hell or the theological necessity of it. You hear this in comments um, from people that, that speak in the world or in social media, and they say things like, I can't believe in a God who would send people to hell. Or something like, how could a loving God send people to a place of eternal suffering? Now, these are challenging issues, and they deserve answers from Christians. So that's our goal today. Our goal is to assess this meme that we're going to take a look at and, and, and to assess the ideas of hell in some depth so that we have a greater understanding of what it is and its impact and role in the world. Now, just to be upfront, it would be impossible to do a full-scale discussion of all the biblical aspects of hell in the space that we have available to us. So our goal today is to address the arguments made about hell in the meme that we have selected for today. We're going to stay really focused on that um, and to biblically address what that meme has to say. But for the sake of providing some background, Um, so that we're clear about what the Bible teaches. Let me take a moment to kind of define hell from a biblical perspective, and then we'll dive into the meme, what the meme actually has to say. So if you're looking for a reasonably broad kind of definition of what hell is from a biblical standpoint, this is it. Hell is the total, conscious, eternal separation from God and all his blessings. Hell is the total, conscious, eternal separation from God and all his blessings. Now, let's, let's kind of take this piece by piece. It, it, the, the definition starts with hell is the total, right? Total, in other words, complete separation from God. The individual in hell is wholly separated from God, in, in, like um, unbridgeably separated from God. Um, Now, in a parable that Jesus told in Luke 16, we kind of see this brought out in in, in a graphic way. Um, Jesus is telling a parable in Luke chapter 16, and we're going to start in verse 19. Uh, So if you have a Bible in front of you, I would encourage you to pull it out and read along with me. But but here we are in, in Luke chapter 16, starting in verse 19. It says, There was a rich man who lived... Um, who who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day, right? And at his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side, which is is kind of a, a, a way of describing heaven. And the rich man also died and was buried in hell where he was in torment, He looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. 
But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted, and you are in agony. And this is the, this is the point I want us to take us away. Verse 26. Notice what he said. Notice what Abraham says to the rich man. And besides all this, between us and you is a, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. You see, see the point that, that Jesus is trying to make with this parable is that between hell and heaven, there is an unbridgeable separation. All right, this is hell is total separation from God. If one ends up in hell, there is no way for him to contact God, to experience God, or to feel the blessing of God. But the definition goes on. Hell is the total conscious, conscious separation from God. Right? So, so in other words, people who end up in hell, they know they're in hell. They experience the suffering and the torment from a conscious perspective. Notice in, in this parable, Jesus, or I'm sorry, not Jesus, but Abraham um, and the rich man are talking, and the rich man says to Abraham, Father Abraham, have pity on me, right? Because he's in hell, right? And he's in torment. And he looks up and he sees Abraham far away and he says, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. Simply put, hell isn't some realm where the soul is simply asleep or unaware. Unlike popular conceptions kind of in our culture, hell is not this perpetual party with other sinners. No, quite the opposite. The soul in hell is completely aware of the absence of God and of all his blessings and experiences every ounce of that absence from a conscious perspective. Notice the man says, I am in agony, in torment, right? He, the, he's, he's experiencing this consciously. But the definition continues. Hell is the total conscious Eternal separation from God. Eternal means forever. There are numerous passages of scripture where hell is clearly defined as an eternal state. In other words, it does not end. In Matthew 25 verse 41, Jesus is telling the parable of the sheep and the goats and Jesus says the following, Then he, um, meaning God, will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Eternal fire. In Mark 9, Jesus is talking about people who are tempted to sin. And he says this, And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out, for it is better to, for you to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown in hell. Notice verse 48, Where the worm that eats them do, the worms that eat them do not die, and the fire is not quenched. All right? There's no end. The worm doesn't ever die. The fire isn't ever quenched. It's never over. All right? Finally, Revelation 20, verse 10 says, And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So directly from the words of Christ, but also from, from the Apostle John in the book of Revelation, we see that hell is clearly an eternal state. Finally, the definition for hell concludes with this. Hell is the total, conscious, eternal separation from God and all his blessings. So simply put, hell is a place of absolute separation from God and from every blessing that comes from God. So think about this. Life Love, joy, peace, security, hope, truth, relationship, fun, you name it. If there is any positive or life-giving thing, hell is devoid of them all. You see, the Bible is clear that all of those things, every good thing, comes from God. And so to be in hell is to be separated from every good thing. 
no exceptions. And to be separated totally, to be separated consciously, and to be separated eternally from God and all of those good things. Now, in addition to the definition of hell that we've been exploring so far, we also see that there are a number of images that are used to describe hell throughout the pages of Scripture. Some of those images include darkness, meaning eternal darkness, no light, not fire, Gnashing of teeth is used in several different places in, uh, in, in the New Testament, especially. It was, it was kind of a phrase Jesus used on several occasions. And, and gnashing of teeth is an image for extreme pain, agony, or suffering. You see, when taken together, right, this, this definition of hell that we've kind of been exploring so far, and these images of hell, present a total picture of hell that is truly terrifying. It's terrifying. And if we're honest, if we're, if we're honest with ourselves, and I think this is legitimate, right? If we're honest, it would be a whole lot easier and a whole lot more palpable to deny this reality as many in our world do, to act as if hell didn't exist. Furthermore, for those of us who are Christians, hell is the enemy, right? Hell is like our enemy. It's, it's the existence that we never, ever want to experience. And it's the existence that we should never want anyone to have to experience. And it's the enemy that we should be trying to help others avoid. But we cannot deny its reality. We can't do that because Jesus affirmed its existence. We can't do that because Jesus taught it as something real and something to be avoided. And finally, Jesus died to keep us from it. So we can't deny its reality. We can't deny that it's clearly taught in the pages of Scripture. So with that context in mind, with that definition of hell, with those images of hell, and with the reality that the Bible speaks to it in so many times, in so many ways, in so many places that we can't possibly act as if it doesn't exist, right? with that context in mind, I want to take us to the meme that we're going to look at today. And it's an interesting one. <laughs> it's an interesting one. It deals with the concept of hell in a very specific way. So I'm going to bring it up on the screen right now, and, and we're going to take a look at it. We're going to assess its claims biblically and, and figure out what it's really trying to say. Here it goes. Here's the, here's the meme. If you need the threat of eternal torture in order to be a good person, you're not a good person. Now, right off the bat, I, I just want to say that I really appreciate the, the super scary looking Satan right off to the side of this meme, uh, complete with the horns and the wings and the spiked tail. I mean, that's nice touch, skeptic uh, meme poster. <laughs> um, wow. So, so, so this, quote, um, this quote within the meme makes a couple of important assumptions. So we got to dig a little bit beneath the surface. What it says, and I'll repeat it again, if you need the threat of eternal torture in order to be a good person, you're not a good person. Now, what I want us to see today as we review this meme and as we think about it is that this meme is really making a couple of very significant assumptions. Right? This meme assumes a couple of things that are really, really important for understanding what the, what the author of this meme is trying to say and that are really, really important if we want to understand them from a biblical perspective. Okay, so, so assumption number one that we find in the text of this meme is this. The assumption being made is that Christians are motivated to live in a righteous way because of their fear of going to hell. Right? Notice, notice what the meme says. If you need the threat of eternal torture in order to be a good person. Right? So the idea here is that, is that Christians are motivated to live in a righteous way because of fear of going to hell. But there's a second assumption that, that is implicit in this meme. And that second assumption is this. We can be good people apart from the biblical realities of God and heaven and hell. All right, th this meme assumes that it's possible to be a good person apart from the biblical realities of heaven and hell. So, so what I want to do today is, is take the time to actually assess this meme, to look at it, and to determine whether or not the assumptions that are being made within this meme are actually true.
and biblically appropriate. All right, so, so the, the meme begins, if you need the threat of eternal torture to be a good person, and we already discussed this a little bit, the assumption being made here is that Christians are motivated to live in a righteous way because of their fear of going to hell. In effect, what the author is trying to say, what the author of this meme is claiming, is that what really motivates Christians to live and act like Christ is because we're afraid of going to hell. Now, immediately upon hearing that, I, I want to say something right off the front. On the one hand, it seems reasonable to admit that it's possible for people to be motivated toward good actions because they're afraid of going to hell. Right? That, that is absolutely possible that people are motivated to do good things and to live a good life because they don't want to go to hell. That's absolutely possible. In fact, there's a whole methodology of preaching called hellfire and brimstone preaching, right? Many of you have, if you've been around church for a long time, you've probably heard of a hellfire and brimstone preacher, right? Um, and, and, and the idea of that style of preaching is to scare people so deeply about the nature of their sin and to scare people about the oncoming reality of hell, that they turn to Christ and start living good lives. So, so to say that there aren't any people in the world who are primarily motivated to do good things out of a desire to avoid hell would be untrue, right? It would be untrue to say that nobody's motivated by fear of hell. Many Christians have leveraged hell as a motivator in the past, and to do so isn't necessarily wrong, but the question we have to ask ourselves is this, is that the most appropriate motivation? Right? Is that the biblical motivation for doing the good things that we are called to do? Is being afraid of going to hell the motivation that the Bible claims is a real driver of good behavior among followers of Christ? And if you look at the Bible, I think you're going to find that the answer is no. It's not. Fear of hell is not the primary motivation of Christ-like behavior. And I want to prove it to you by taking you to a very important passage of Scripture. All right. Now, now before we go to that Scripture, I just want to, I want to paint a little picture for you. If you were to walk uptown right now and you were to grab any person that was walking by and you, and you ask them the question, what makes a person a good person? Like if you were to just walk up to a random stranger and you were to ask them, what makes a person a good person? They'd probably tell you that a good person is someone who loves others or who, who does kind things, right? Right? Love typically is the word that gets thrown out when we talk about good people. In, in the world in which we live even today, even in our culture right now, if you were to describe a good person in purely secular terms, most of the time people would say something like, well, they're probably a loving person. Okay, right, well, the passage we're going to go to today is 1 John chapter 4. And John gives us a beautiful passage of scripture on the concept of love. So again, this meme is making the claim that what motivates Christians to be good people, or right, to be loving people, is the fear of hell. Right? The thing that drives us to be loving and good is the fear of hell. But here in 1 John, we see a completely different motivation being offered. So let's dive into this passage. This is 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. All right, so I'd invite you to, to dive into the scripture with me. If you have a Bible in front of you, turn there and let's, let's dive in. 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse 8, and we're, we're going to read several verses in this chapter. It begins like this. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Now think about that. By, think about what he's saying. He's saying, if you don't love people, right? So whoever does not love, right? Whoever doesn't love people, thus being what people in this world typically call a good person, right? If you're not a loving and good person, 
right? Then you don't know God. <laughs> that's, what, that's what John's saying. He's saying it's an impossibility to be hateful and mistreat others in our world and to be in love with God at the same time. You can't do it. Now, now I want to pause here for a moment and, and, and just remind you that we have to be careful when we go throwing the word love around. Because our culture has dramatically changed the definition of the word. You see, in America in the 21st century, we basically define love as accepting or affirming someone regardless of what they do or say or believe. That's basically the definition that our culture has for the word love. So, so here in America, right now in the 21st century, to disagree with somebody about their choices or their or 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 by the standard uh, by the uh, anyway, long story short, to to disagree with somebody or to to argue against a person's style of behavior or life or, or the things that they do, right? is to hate them and be unloving toward them. That's kind of the definition in our culture. But that's not what the Bible says. You see, many in our culture would have us believe that love means we can't confront or challenge anyone on their behavior. But from a biblical perspective, lovingly and kindly and compassionately pointing out the sin in somebody else's life is among the most loving things a Christian can do. Right? So, so I know that was a bit of an aside, but, but, the, but the point of all that was this. Verse 8 is telling us that we can't know or be in a relationship with God if our attitude toward others is not loving. But John goes on, verse 9. This is how God showed his love among us. All right, so, so, so now he turns to, t to basically make the claim that, that God loves and defines love in a very practical way. And what is that? This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Effectively, what John is saying is that love is sacrifice and service to others. And God showed his love among us in that he sent his son into the world so that we might live through him. Think about how God showed love to all of us. He sent his son into the world to teach us, to show us how to love, and ultimately to die on our behalf. Right? That is what love is. It's service and sacrifice on behalf of somebody else. But in verse 10, John clarifies specifically what Jesus did that defined love and proved his love for us. Check this out. Verse 10, this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So notice what John is saying. He's saying he says, this is love, right? Jesus coming into the world, preparing himself to serve and sacrifice for us, right? Right. He says, this is love. Not that we loved God. So Jesus didn't come here because we were so faithful in serving and worshiping God. He didn't come here just because he wanted to be near a bunch of people who were so naturally good. He came here because we were desperately sinful. Notice what it says. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Jesus came because we are desperately sinful, not because we're good. Right? He, he came... He came because we are sinful and unable to be good enough to enter into a relationship with God on our own goodness. Jesus died as an act of love for people who didn't even love him. Isaiah 53.3 says he was despised and rejected by his own people. And yet he died as an atoning sacrifice for our sin, purchasing our forgiveness and offering us a relationship with God the Father. So God's love drove him to sacrifice his own son for us and to serve our needs. That's what love is, service and sacrifice to others. But now let's skip down to verse 16 because something interesting begins to happen down here. It's in the same chapter, verse 16. Look at what John says. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. 
This verse says that God is love. In other words, he not only has shown love, but it's his very nature to be loving. And he's shown love in sending his son to rescue us so that whenever we live in love, which is a phrase that means we act lovingly and we act with kindness toward others, we are living out our relationship with God. Whoever lives in love, living a lifestyle of loving kindness toward God and others, is living in God and God in them. So when we are living out that relationship with God, he is working through us to bring more love into the world. But John goes on, verse 17, This is how love is made complete among us, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. Now, I'm going to stop there for just a second. He says, he says love is what is made complete in us, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. Now, notice how John connects love and the day of judgment. In other words, the day when we all get sent to an eternal heaven or hell. That's the day of judgment, biblically speaking. What gives us confidence when we stand before God? What gives us assurance that we will be one of those people invited into an eternal home with Christ? Is it because we lived a good life because we were afraid of hell? What does he say gives us confidence? Right? Notice, he says, this is how love is made complete in us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment in this world. We are like Jesus. In this world, we are like Jesus. So to be loving is to be like Jesus. And when we are loving and like Jesus, in other words, when we act in love and in service to others because that's what Christ came to do, right? He came to teach us truth. He came to die on our behalf. And our responsibility, if we want to have confidence on the day of judgment, is to do what Jesus did, to live and to love and to serve others through teaching them the truth and through serving their needs. You see, what gives us confidence on the, on the day of judgment is not that we lived in fear of hell, but rather that we lived in love as Christ did in the world. We aren't motivated by a fear of hell ultimately, but by a desire to be like Christ. Now notice what the next verse says because it drives a stake through the idea that the fear of hell is the driver of true Christ-likeness. Notice what it says. Here, here we go. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Now I want to stop and I want to go back through this piece by piece because this is super important. There is no fear in love means that true Christ-like action isn't driven by the fear of, well, if I don't do this nice thing, I might end up in hell, right? That's, that's not, that's, that's love out of fear. That's not true love because there is no fear in love. I mean, let's be honest. Think about it this way. If all that drives us to do loving things for others is because we're afraid of going hell, then we are simply self-centered. We're simply self-centered. Think about it. If, if we try to live good lives simply to avoid hell, then all we're doing is focusing on avoiding punishment for ourselves. We're not really doing good things for others. We're focused on avoiding a drastic punishment. It, it creates a situation where there's a secondary motive behind every kind and loving thing we do. It's not really about the person that we're serving. No, it's about stacking up another check mark on the good side so that we won't spend eternity in torment. Right? So, so perfect love drives out fear. We aren't acting from fear if we are living in God's love. But notice the passage says, perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. In other words, when we have accepted the true love of Christ as shown on the cross, we are no longer motivated to do loving things because we're afraid of hell. Instead, our faith in Christ and in his atonement, we recognize that our faith in Christ and his atoning sacrifice on the cross for us is what keeps us out of hell. So we're not worried about that anymore. 
Because we know that we, we, we have believed on and put our faith and trust and we are living our lives in love to Christ. So we don't have to worry about hell anymore. Right? So what drives us to do the kind and loving things that we do? Right? We're driven to do these things simply because we want to radiate the, the kind of love that Christ showed to every single one of us. We want as many people as possible to experience the love that we feel in Christ. That is the motivator for our behavior. He goes on to say, John does, the one who fears isn't made perfect in love. Simply put, if fear of our own soul going to hell is driving our behavior, then we haven't really grasped the gospel of Christ that the, and there is some part of us that is still trying to earn our salvation through our good deeds. You see, but for Christians, the, the deeds come as a result of our faith, not the other way around. As the passage states in conclusion, we love because he first loved us. We love others because he first loved us. It's his love that motivates our love, not fear of hell. Ultimately, from a biblical standpoint, the fear of hell is not a good biblical motivator for Christ-like behavior. You see, it's only when we truly recognize how deeply loved we are in Christ and how much he sacrificed to purchase our forgiveness and salvation that we are truly motivated to live godly lives toward God and others. So assumption one in this, in this meme is false. The primary biblical motivator for Christ-like behavior is not a fear of hell, but rather a recognition of Christ's amazing, sacrificial, and servant-hearted love for us that we want to radiate out to other people. All right? So assumption one is false. But let's deal with the second assumption that's evident in this post. If you recall, the meme said, if you need the threat of eternal torture to be a good person, then you're not a good person. Simply put, the second main assumption being made in this meme is that we can be good people apart from the realities, the biblical realities of God and heaven and hell. Said another way, this post is making the claim that it's possible for us to be a good people and not need God or the Bible or heaven or hell to motivate us toward those good behaviors. We can just be good people. Now, it's just my hunch, but my guess is that the creator of this meme would actually go so far as to claim that you're a better person if you do good things and yet reject the ideas of God and the Bible and heaven and hell. But there are multiple problems with this assertion. And the first one is this. Without God, what does being a good person actually mean? Think about it. Without God... What does being a good person actually mean? You see, the Bible claims that God is the ultimate decider of what is good and what is evil. As the creator of the world, he is the authority on what is good and what is evil. So being a person doing, so being a good person is doing what he said is good and doing them for the reasons that he said to do them. And from a biblical perspective, being an evil or wicked person, by contrast, is, is rejecting and disobeying what God said and having wrong and selfish motives for doing the things that we do. So from a biblical perspective, the concepts of good and evil are grounded solely in the reality of God. But if there is no God, which my guess is this meme creator probably believes, and many in our culture believe, if there is no God, then who decides what's good? Who decides? Who decides what's good? Who decides what's evil? You? Me? Well, that might be okay if there weren't over 7 billion people on the planet, all with their own ideas about what is good and evil, right and wrong. With that many people deciding what's good and evil for themselves, many of us will disagree on what's good and evil in certain situations. We'll just disagree. We'll naturally disagree. So who's to say that anyone's opinion of what's good or evil is better than anybody else's? You see, ultimately what this leads to, and it's inevitable, right? It's inevitable. There's no way around this. 
If there is no God, it leads to a situation in which all morality becomes subjective based on the person or the situation, but no, no ultimate absolutes. When morality becomes subjective, there is no way of saying that anything is absolutely good or absolutely evil. So in a world without God, you might look at me. Just let, let's, let's give an example here. In a world without God, you might look at me and you might watch my life and you might listen to my teaching and you might watch the things that I do and say, wow, you know, J.D.'s a really good guy. And somebody else might look at the exact same life and the exact same teachings and the exact same behaviors and say, man, J.D. is a terrible person. Right? <laughs> Right? Like, if, if morality is subjective, philosophically speaking, then there's no real way to judge what a good person is or is not. It's merely your opinion. It's merely my opinion. And in, in, a, in a subjective moral worldview, what makes your opinion of what's good any better than mine? Or anybody else's for that matter? You see, subjective moral reality is where you end up when you reject the biblical foundation of God and the biblical foundations of God's clear definition of good and evil and the biblical realities of heaven and hell. When you reject those things, ultimately what you end up with is subjective moral reality. There's no way around it. All right? And that's a problem because there really is no way to be a good person if you can't define what a good person is. So you might think a person is a good person, but that doesn't actually make it so. Right? But biblically speaking, there's a second and even bigger problem with assumption number two, that we can be good people apart from the realities of God. Right? There's a second and bigger problem, and that is this. Apart from Christ... The Bible is clear, good people don't even exist. Apart from Christ, good people don't exist. Now, I want to take you to Psalm 14. If you have a Bible in front of you, I want you to turn over to Psalm 14. And I want you to look at the first few verses and what it has to say. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Now, I want you to notice that. This verse connects foolish people with the rejection of the existence of God. So, so for the psalmist here, he's very clearly saying, if you don't believe there's a, there's a, that there's a God, you're a fool. And that's, that's, it's right there in the text. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. And, and to reject God is to reject the realities of heaven and hell as well. All right, so if fools are people who don't believe in God, what result does that unbelief have on their behavior, right? What is the impact on their life by not believing that there's a God? Notice the rest of verse 1. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. Notice that. Pay attention to that for a moment. People who reject the biblical view of God are by very nature People who are corrupted, sinful, and do the opposite of good. They're not good people. Right? Notice what verses 2 and 3 says. Two, verses 2 and 3 say, The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, any who seek after God. And then verse 3 answers, God's longing look upon the world to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. They have all. If you have a Bible in front of you, I might, I might even encourage you to like just underline or maybe even circle that word in your Bible. They have all turned aside. Together, you might circle or underline that word. Together, they have become corrupt. There is none, you might circle or underline that word. There is none who does good, not even one. Simply put, God is looking down on the whole earth. Right? He's looking down on the whole earth and evaluating the lives of every single human being. And he's saying, nope. 
apart from me, there aren't any good people. Not even one. Make no mistake, God sees all of humanity as hopelessly lost and sinful. There are no good people. Right? Everything in us, everything inside of us wants to act like this is not true. Everything inside of us wants us to believe that we are good people. Everything inside of us wants us to believe that, that our friends or our family or all that kind of stuff. There are no good people. <laughs> From a biblical perspective, we have to understand this. There is no one who does good, not even one. Apart from Christ, there are no good people. Right? And that is why God sent Christ into the world to die for our sins and to relieve us of the burden of having to be good people in order to earn our salvation. He recognized very clearly that we could not because we aren't. Right? He, offered, he offered us grace instead of making us work. And as a result, all of us who are Christians can very happily say, I'm not a good person, but in Christ I am forgiven. Right? I'm not a good person. Guys, and, and, I, and I'm not even just saying that as, as a way of like teaching you something. I'm telling you, I am not a good person, but in Christ I am forgiven. There are so many sins and so many flaws and so many weaknesses in my own heart and life and so many failed moments and so many bad decisions and so many poor choices in my life. I am not a good person, but in Christ I am forgiven. And now, as a result, I and you who believe, we are free to love and to serve others, not from a place of fear, but out of gratitude for having been saved by the marvelous love of Christ, totally apart from us actually earning it. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Simply put, Christ's love is what drives us to, to be the people that Christ has called us to be. We no longer live for ourselves, but we live in love toward others, not because we are by nature good people, but instead because we have been saved by the one good person who ever existed. As we, had, as we discovered while we were addressing the first assumption, it's Christ's love that drives us because he died for us. So it's as if we paid the punishment, but he did it for us. Therefore, we live not as people who are solely interested in ourselves and our own well-being, but instead we live for Christ and extend his radical love to anyone and everyone who is willing to listen to us. Which means that we have to reject assumption number two on biblical grounds because it's not possible to be a truly good person apart from God. Now, I want to make a really important distinction here, okay? Because I've been pounding this point really hard and I just want to, I want to make a distinction because it's very important for me to do so. I'm not saying that we can't do good things apart from God. Okay, people do good things apart from God all the time. Atheists work in soup kitchens. Skeptics treat people with kindness and respect. I, you know, doing good things is not the same thing as being a good person. Right? What I'm saying is that doing isolated acts of kindness and goodness doesn't actually make us good people. Far from it. The Bible makes it clear that the standard of goodness is perfection. And as a result, we don't fit that description. In one really powerful example in Luke chapter 18, um, verses 18 and 19, um, this guy comes running up to Jesus. And it goes like this, a certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And I want you to notice Jesus' response. 
The guy calls him good teacher. In verse 19, Jesus says, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now I want you to see what's going on here. Right? The guy comes running up to Jesus and he calls him good teacher. And Jesus confronts him. He says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now, there's a couple things going on here. One, Jesus is tacitly claiming his divinity here. Because he doesn't actually tell the guy that he's wrong for calling him good. He just, he just gives him a moment to think about the fact that because he called him good, and God is the only one who is good, that Jesus is in fact God. Right? That's, that's what Jesus is really trying to communicate to this guy here. But at, a, at another level, right, he's also claiming this. That God is the only one who can lay claim to the descriptor good. He's the only one to whom that definition applies. God's moral perfection is the reason that he can be called good and we can't. Take a look at, take a look at Psalm 1830, for example. As for God, his way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. Deuteronomy 32.4 says he is the rock. His works are perfect. All his ways are just. You see, God's perfection when compared to our imperfection means that no one on a human level gets to claim to be good. Apart from Christ, we aren't good people. We are by nature self-centered, fearful, angry, prone to conflict. But with Christ, we can, we can be other-centered. We can be loving and kind and joyful and peaceful. It's possible. right? But we have to stop seeing ourselves as naturally good people and recognize that our only hope... Our only hope for sustaining goodness and right living in this life is to be connected to the perfect God. It requires us to commit ourselves to seeking Christ's likeness. So guys, here's the deal. In the end, this meme presents two false views. Right? It presents, first and foremost, the false view of how Christianity is motivated. Right? Love, not fear of hell, is what drives good and Christ-like behavior among followers of Christ. But this meme also presents a false view about the goodness of people apart from God. The Bible is crystal clear. Without God, we aren't good. And the sooner we recognize that and own it, the more we will pray for God's help and read God, God's word for direction and guidance and power to be the people he has called us to be. So there you go, guys. Um, this meme, in a nutshell, presents us with two false views. One, about how Christianity is motivated, and two, about our ability to be good without God. I hope this has been helpful to you, and I hope that you've enjoyed diving into this subject today. I certainly have enjoyed getting to spend time with you, reading through it, and learning together. If you have any follow-up questions, you're welcome to throw them at me down in the comments, or you can email me at jd at goodnewsgathering.org, and I'll respond to you as quickly as I can. Guys, thank you for taking this time to dig deeper into God's Word with me. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care, have a great day, and I look forward to being, being with you as we dig deeper into God's word in coming weeks. Thank you, take care, love you guys, and have an awesome day.